Right. <laughs> well, at least turn off the red light. So <laughs> this is the secret wrong. on the record council cabal meeting that is being videotaped. We are in Massachusetts, so we are subject to uh, open, open meeting laws. Open meeting laws. So ah. if we have three of us, we have to be. What about open beverage laws? Those are different. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, really? So open meetings may not contain right. open beverages. Okay, this is good to know. This is good to know. Do we have a plan for this meeting, Brian? I believe the answer is no. Is that? Um, well, technically, we have a plan. It's just not a very good one. <laughs> Would you like to relay the not very good plan? Because all of you chose to come to this meeting, we will not be doing open mic stand up. So this is the part of the meeting where you have to ask questions because you chose to come. Uh, we recognize the gentlewoman in the second row. <laughs> yeah, that is a good question. The question was, are we taking questions? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are, in fact, taking questions. Um, anyone who would like to ask a question? I'm sorry, you've already asked a question. Anyone else who would like to ask a question? <laughs> Amita, what is your question? So I'm going to repeat the question first, uh, and I'm going to paraphrase it a bit. The uh, blog post that was written by Matthew um, and was actually read by a number of members of council before it was posted um, so that he doesn't have to take all the blame. Um, and a lot of the communication that has come out of the council has indicated a desire to align the activities, uh, what we're working on, as well as like how we spend our money around the objectives of the uh, project. The primary objectives that have been identified by the council being the, the CI and modularity components as well as we have things like Mindshare and the additions of Fedora. And so the core question was how do we align non like technically contributing parts of the project around these things and is there any scope for expansion of these? And I'm going to actually hand the mic to Matthew if that's okay with everybody because he gave a good version of the answer I think earlier that I would like to have him repeat, maybe? All right, I'm gonna say an answer, and then if it's not the one you were looking for, you can you know, like prompt me until I come up with the thing you think I said that was good. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I think I, I do have two separate answers to it. Um, one of them is that uh, the things that we've identified, the, uh, the CI and modularity objectives, are, they're both technical things, but in general, like, what we're doing in Fedora overall is technical, and the tech, all the technical things have very important non-technical aspects to them that are important within that. So uh, we're going to need all of the soft things around you know, CI and modularity, like that's going to need documentation, it's going to need design, it's going to need uh, just you know, people talking about it, and those kind of things which are less technical. So that's one aspect of it. And I think the other aspect is like we have identified those objectives right now. Um, we have room for more objectives, and so there are other things that can fit within the mission that um, could also possibly be um, more aligned with some of the things people are interested in that uh, we haven't you know, put up right now as uh, the things we're focusing on. Is either of those close to what you thought it I was going to say? Um, do you want to chain? Otherwise, I will. I was going to add 
make one very simple statement is that we are fundamentally missing objectives that we know are important to Fedora that do not have essentially objective write-ups and sponsors. Um, you know, as I jokingly keep reminding Matt, you know, I wrote some examples of those things in that blog post. You know, I just completely made them up, but you know, this is the whole point is that the first part of your statement is, should all of the funding and work and everything else be focused around those objectives? Yes. Second part of that question is, are the objectives complete? No. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, only, the only piece that I would add, if, if nobody has an objection, and I don't want to chain in too long, uh, you specifically mentioned things like Fedora Women's Day, which I did not put in my paraphrasing, and I happen to know you're very active on the diversity group, which I also did not put in my paraphrasing. Um, the activities of that group create opportunities for new contributors to the project and new users of the project. There is absolutely no reason why a, say, Fedora Women's Day activity could not be focused on a female community that would lead to modularity contributors. So there is a heavy alignment there. Um, so it's just we need to look at the right way to, to put it all together so that we're attracting, in your case, because you're thinking about diversity, we're attracting a diverse community of people who are going to align well with what we're trying to do. Going out and attracting, I don't know, llama farmers, because they're my favorite group to pick on these days, is not necessarily going to align well with what we're trying to accomplish in Fedora. So attracting a large, diverse group of them is just going to lead to a large, diverse group of people who are upset because we're not doing something that makes sense to them. And I, I think that answers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> the other piece, too, is that um, the, the council, I don't expect it to be particularly draconian. So make the proposal, find some rough tie-in to one of the objectives, and see what happens. Um, you know, so uh, you know, the, the idea is just that I think the council and the budget process, we felt like it was really um, uh, kind of black boxy. Uh, you know, it was like you know, money went out to these various regions, and there was very little kind of information back about like how successful is this? Is it aligned with what we're trying to do? Is it, you know, can it be improved? Could, could we learn from each other about how we do things differently? And so this was an attempt to make it so that it could be a little bit more transparent and it could be a little bit more focused and with actual metric results. Um, it may not be a great idea, it's, but it's one we, you know, came up with to start with, right? And we'll see how it goes. Uh, next question from the gentleman in the front row. This isn't so much a question as it is something I want to discuss. Uh, so in the ambassador's note, um, or supply that align with Fedora goals, right? And let's say one of the goals is uh, containers and autonomy cars. You know, right now in order to attend events like a typical vacation week, you need you know, two ambassadors, and at least one of them should be experienced in coming and talking and meeting. Um, but to go to say, you know, some conference or other related to containers, uh, you would have to say have somebody who's an expert on containers and somebody who's an experienced ambassador. You would basically have to not have to drag the container expert along. Uh, yeah, let me. Do you think that's reasonable? I, I'm just going to repeat okay. kind of what you said, and then I'll hand you the mic. Um, what I'm hearing from you is that given a hypothetical objective or alignment around containers, for example. Uh, today, when an ambassador attends a general Linux event, we will typically send two ambassadors, um, oftentimes an experienced ambassador and then a new ambassador, and they will work the event. But if we were to attend a specialized event, such as a containers event, we need someone who is not only good as an ambassador, but we also need a container expert. And what are we going to do about that? Is that the general gist of the discussion? Yeah. Okay. Mr. Miller? Um, I think that's a good thing, I guess. Uh, I think it is, uh, we've definitely had a problem with um, you know, very little communication between ambassadors and the rest of the project for a while in both directions. Like it's people, you know, technical people don't really think, you know, working, I'm just working on this stuff and not like how will I engage ambassadors to help you know, bring this to people. And ambassadors you know, haven't been you know, dragging container experts or whatever to talk. So I think anything we can do to help that happen is, actually really good um, I don't know how to do it uh, but but I think I think it is 
definitely a good thing to strive for. And I think you know, we do have those container experts in the community, and a lot of them are outgoing, friendly, nice people who just you know, maybe don't know the way the ambassador's project works. So I think that pairing you're talking about is um, very possible and a good, strong thing we've got going. Of course, Langdon has more to say. Um, so while I generally agree with you, I disagree with the necessary point in a sense. Like, I don't actually think you need a container expert to go and talk about containers. I mean, you don't need, you know, somebody who, um, you know, is an expert in, you know, the bootloader to go and, and pitch Fedora today, right? I mean, they, you know, you, you're not trying to go and teach people how containers work. I think you could, and it doesn't hurt. But I don't, I don't actually see a juxtaposition between that and, and saying, hey, you know, we have this distribution. It's, uh, you know, one aspect of it, you know, the addition is kind of very focused on good run times for containers. Somebody asks you back how to build a particular container, I'm like, I don't know, you know, it, but we have lots of them available. We have a community around it, you know, come and join us and talk about it. I mean, so I'm not 100% in agreement that you actually need that expert in the objective just because you know, you want to kind of approach Fedora, or potential Fedora people. Yeah, I basically agree with that, except I think sometimes um, some, some of these new technologies are um, kind of scary and foreign to people who are in the ambassadors. Um, not that it's, th things are changing a lot, these are new things, and you're not, you, just because you're an ambassador doesn't mean you're up on everything. So I think that it would be good as a project, and if, you know, the people doing the, um, doing the objectives, have materials that are useful for the ambassadors. Like we, we need to start producing those things as part of the documentation stuff, part of marketing. Like this is things that, um, so, so if you're an ambassador who is basically, you have a crash course in what you're talking about when you go to the conference so you um, don't feel like you're too stupid to be there. Um, like you know the basics and you know like where to refer to people to other things as well. Okay, I'll let Robert speak. Yeah, <coughs> this is um, this topic is something um, uh, which Mindshare should care about, and uh, uh, I think <coughs> one of the main goals of Mindshare is, is uh, to improve the communication between technical teams and outreach teams, and uh, this could lead also to uh, find out which persons we need in that event and and uh, to be. Um, as best present as possible um, to the user experience. Um, uh, sending sending their two ambassadors which don't know anything about containers is, um, doesn't make that, that, that sense, I think. So having one expert and one ambassador is mu much more useful <coughs> than having two ambassadors there. So, I was just going to add very briefly, while I agree with everything that's been said, I'm going to play devil's advocate on the other side. Um, I work for the OSAS team at Red Hat as part of my role, and one of the things that my boss metrics my teammates on is the number of times that we sent someone who wasn't us. And so I would turn that around a bit to the ambassadors and I would say, part of your role is of course to represent the project. Part of your role is to identify where the project should be represented and to get the right person to the right place. So there are definitely certain events, certain kinds of talks, et cetera, where we may literally send no ambassadors and we give somebody the equivalent of what Matthew brought up, which is here's the sheet on how you help somebody get to the rest of the project, but we're expecting you to go there because you're a kernel engineer and they're all kernel engineers and that's what they're gonna be talking about. Um, so it, it kind of works both ways as an outreach activity. Um, so just another form of that to keep in mind. And, and I apologize, you were going to talk and then... Oh, sorry. I was just going to add some context too because I knew like some of the concern was also with about budget and like a smaller pool of Fedora ambassadors like in, in the specific example of North America. So... Right. Right, so you'd have greater travel costs in combination with possibly fewer events because you would have increased travel costs to get people from different areas and locations. So right, so I, I think, in my mind, I think definitely a huge part of this is along with Mindshare and trying to create 
easier talking points for some of these more advanced technical topics. So we can actually send people from our existing pool and try to train them on some, or train them, provide them with the information and tools for success to be, to have an impact at these new kind of events. So I, I think it would be a combination of, of kind of both things, of being strategic with kind of the people we are sending to events, which might bring increased travel costs. And like an example of North America, where you might have maybe 15 people for both sides of the, of the coast, right? right? But I also think another part of it is also putting confidence into our existing pool of ambassadors, which I think is something that has been identified already as an active focus to try to make some of these really complicated and really complex things into more easier to understand talking points. So like an example of marketing, we have, like it's kind of like these things that we have, like talking points every release. We have like, what's new in Fedora? New things in Workstation, Server, Cloud, or Atomic. So it's really easy for an ambassador to understand. I think that's a really great way for us to try to kind of take some of these technical topics, even some things that aren't already included like in the marketing talking points, to try to make it easier for our ambassadors to understand these things and also have the confidence and feel like they can be successful at some of these kinds of events. So I feel like it's kind of a middle ground approach that we need to take, where it'd be also some of the ambassadors trying to do more outreach, maybe other people in our community, and coming with maybe a little higher travel costs for some of them, in combination with providing the resources and information to help our existing ambassadors feel confident at these kind of events. So Brian was just showing me um, here. I'll have this right mic right over directly and cut off the middle man. According to the budget page today, there's $42,000 in unallocated cash. So I'm not worried about the ability of a region to come back and go, we have this event, we need somebody yet, and it's gonna have an extra $400 plane ticket or a $1,000 plane ticket and cost with hotels associated with it, and we don't have the money in our current budget. Right. We know why it's important to be there, we need that money. And that's part of the goal of what the council's doing by sitting on this pot of money is not because we enjoy swimming in it like Scrooge McDuck, but it's because we want to have this money available for these kinds of important functions and not necessarily locked up in a sub-budget somewhere where we can't access it to hand it to the group that's got the idea to run to the finish line. It actually dovetails into what I was going to say, but basically you're saying, you know, um, and, but you, you don't want to, you don't want a fedora booth populated with salespeople, right? Um, or, or non-technical, right? Right. Right. So, you know, I guess, um, I guess I, I don't necessarily share the, um, I don't mind being an idiot. So, um, you know, I'll walk in there and anybody asks me a question, if I don't know the answer, I'll go find out and then I'll bring it back to them. Um, but the, the only point I was going to add, really, which kind of dovetails to what you're talking about, I think there's actually ridiculously more experts available than you may be aware of. Um, I know for me, like, uh, I didn't know for a long time that there was the kind of, that there was a channel for which I could say, hey, I'm going to be in this area, you know, is there anything I can do to, like, present at a meetup or something like that? Um, so I, I actually think there's there's probably more experts out there than necessarily realize that don't know that there's a need um, to be able to man a booth or whatever. So you might be pleasantly surprised if we find a better way to f try to find them. Um, and I think that's part of the issue, which you're kind of identifying before. Um, but I, I do think that there may be more than you know of that we have to figure out how to expose or whatever the right word is. I just would like to ask a question. Uh, do you see, the, or the proposal you made, is it uh, some uh, issue you are currently facing, or is it a proposal how to make things better? I'm just trying uh, to figure out how to make it better. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, so it's not like current hot issue we need to solve immediately, or it's, Yes, it is. <laughs> it is.
she got she had been specialized as a pastor for like so long, probably. I mean, maybe we can share, I will surely share ambassadors who are good, let's say, in passion programming. So we can make, we can split ambassadors into working groups. So ambassadors who are good at Python, ambassadors who are good at um, Ansible, and so on and so forth. And we can somehow manage how to send those ambassadors to respective events. But that's the, the problem is we don't have that many uh, active ambassadors. I mean, we can work around. So I, I, I'm going to actually interrupt you only because um, I think that there's going to be some great conversation on these kinds of specific level ways to solve this in sessions like the Mindshare session. Um, and yes, when is your session? Thursday at 2 p.m. I'm sorry? Thursday. Thursday. Thursday at 2 p.m. Uh, in the Mindshare session. There's a session by NB and Yona at... Thursday at 3 p.m. How convenient. Like, it's almost like the scheduling committee knew. Um, but they're going to be talking about uh, the future of ambassadors as well. So uh, I think that for the purposes of the council conversation, we should keep it not to necessarily how ambassadors can affect the change as much as how can we as council support you in affecting a change that makes sense. And it may be a different thing in NA or for American ambassadors than, say, for Greek ambassadors. Yeah, that's actually just what I was going to say. I think we need to make sure there's a bridge between you know, the specific objectives. Like right now, there are two. So it's not like we have an infinite list of things to worry about. So you know, talk to Langdon, talk to Steph, like maybe set up a thing with the ambassadors and, the, uh, and those working groups and see what, um, what specific things can be worked out. Um, thank you. Yes. So many different products. Great. Now we have the three, the three editions and two episodes. You know, there's and there's this sort of expanded into so many different things that are being rolled out with, or without a whole lot of explanation. So and we've got, so we have have on our wiki a page talking about here is why we want this, and it goes through a list of PDFs and videos. And there are numerous internal reasons that say, or that shall not or shall not be mentioned. What what should I be telling people? Yeah. Um, so basically, if you look at Fedora Next, right, um, as the beginning, we've kind of been proceeding along that path. And we had Fedora Next, right? I, that's what I'm doing. Um, so we had Fedora Next, which led to kind of the ring story, which led to the addition story. And then it kind of morphed into the modularity story. You're supposed to be here, Steph. Um, so, and the, the question basically is that how should we be explaining modularity uh, as an objective? As, um, you know, maybe the ring story was simpler to explain, the additions was simpler to explain. Um, and personally, the way I explain modularity is it's a desire to disconnect the life cycle of the, particularly the OS from the applications that uh, sit on top of it and the applications from each other, which is kind of the antithesis of the distribution model. So that's really what the goal of modularity is. It's taking the additions and going another step further and saying, how can we actually disconnect the individual pieces from each other? So someone on the develop list said, in response to basically that, that's not really a goal. That's a, uh, a th step on the way to some uh, other goal. What, is the, what, what does doing that get us? Like if, we, if we have that split, what do we get from it? Um, Adam, I think, actually came up with this tagline, which is um, giving a user the version of the thing that they want when they want it, um, instead of the, you know, kind of the authors of the distribution deciding what version of things that a user wants and when they get it. <coughs> is I really like that explanation, but it's I think it's easier written than it is verbally. <laughs> um, does that make sense to anybody? Can somebody else paraphrase that differently? So right now, Fedora tells you when you get the new version of whatever, right? And you get it, whether you like it or not, right? You can, you can try to pin, you can try to hack it, you can try to avoid upgrades, but basically Fedora tells you when you will get something. 
Modularity, the idea is the reverse, is that Fedora makes it available, and then you choose as a consumer when to consume it. And so that consumer could be, you know, you take something like Redmine, which is like a ticketing system in Rails, right? So whenever the new version of Rails comes out, Fedora pushes that new version of Rails, and you're gonna get it for Redmine, whether Redmine is ready for it or not. Right? My, actually, my classic example of this was uh, P, uh, sorry, Drupal. I used to work for a company that specialized in doing Drupal. And um, PHP 5.2 to 5.3 had caused breaking changes in Drupal. And all of the distros upgraded to 5.3, and lots and lots of Drupal broke. Um, and so that's exactly the problem we're trying to avoid. Right? So you have that kind of consumer, which is like a developer consuming the new version of things when they're ready to consume it. Uh, and then you have other kinds of consumers, like you know, humans who are sitting in a workstation. They want the, you know, the, the rolling release of Firefox because they want the bleeding edge version. Oh wait, but this other guy doesn't because none of his extensions work, right? So you have all these different use cases where all these different people, depending on the scenario in which they find themselves, have completely different rules for when they want to upgrade or, you know, or remain the same. And everybody thinks that their own personal experience is the actual answer for everyone else, right? And in fact, it's pretty much by use case. And you may even have different answers depending on which computer you're talking about, right? So in your container, for example, you may want all the bleeding edge stuff, right? Or in your uh, you know, server in your basement, you want you know, nothing to ever upgrade ever, right? Or on your laptop, you want the bleeding version of you know, Firefox, but you want them to leave Emacs alone. You know? so, Everybody has different answers to these questions. They have different answers to these questions depending on the time of the day and use case and scenario and environment, and that's what we want to enable. Mike McGrath makes a Reddit reference. <laughs> Do you want to repeat what he just said, not the Reddit reference? So uh, uh, an example of kind of communities. So um, I actually don't know it either, and I actually use Reddit too. Um, but uh, so uh, another example is uh, when you talk about community use cases. So in other words, does the Node.js community have the same requirements out of their distribution or have the same life cycle out of their distribution or what they, you know, what they want to give to their end users as the Perl community? I mean, you know, any day now we'll get Perl 6, right? Um, so, is that the one? Right, and there's no way in a traditional distribution model, not, not just Fedora, any of them, to def allow for any sort of variation between different kinds of communities. You know, GNOME is a great example, right? I mean, you know, GNOME wants to rebase whatever, it's every six months? Every year? It's every six months? Um, you know, and a part of the reason for the release timeline for Fedora right now is because of glibc, right? Because they want to release every six months. Um, so, you know, we have all of these communities that have different needs and different goals, and then we have all these different, end u and those are diff different kinds of consumers. Um, all of them want to set their own life cycle around different things. So one thing um, I think I've seen of a lot of the, um, like, modularity gives us a lot of capability to do a lot of things, uh, and I think some of it is a, just because we could do that doesn't mean we're going to, let alone that we should. Uh, so one of the things I think is the question is like, how many modules are we gonna have? Is there a separate module for every individual package? Will there be 14 versions of like GCAL available to everybody? Um, I hope not, I, that would be terrible. Um, we can't possibly sustain that. So I think that um, modules are going to be you know, leaf applications and things like language stacks. Um, Probably, um, may maybe not, but I think that's where we'll focus things. I think things will kind of grow out of there rather than the, now everything's a module, um, good luck, put together a distro. I don't, I, I think that a lot of the worry I've seen kind of is projecting that endpoint and worrying from it, and I don't think that's where we're aiming for. Is that? Um, I add one piece of, I mean. So the, and, and there's a key difference about, it enables a lot of things that we could do. But you know what, right now, we can't do half this stuff, right? We can't do 80% of it. 
We, it just, it fundamentally doesn't fit through our infrastructure. It doesn't, you know, we have an infrastructure that is designed around uh, taking binaries, putting them into RPMs, and producing one product, right? Um, we went crazy and now produce a few different products, and oh my God, the heartache involved in making all of that stuff go, right? Like, that's just going from one to like five, right? You start introducing containers and then you want to have specialized VMs or you want to have specialized anything, like it just goes insane. The infrastructure just falls apart. And what it really also lets you do is lets you start to think about it differently. And part of the goal for me is that I don't know where it's going to go. And like this guy, for example, decided, hey, here's a way we can model CI, right, in using modularity, right? I mean, you might have been able to do it another way, but um, I'm going to hassle Steph and make him answer about using atomic for modules was all. Uh, modularity is the sham wow of, <laughs> of, <laughs> of an atomic host based on CI. Uh, there's a list of uh, stuff that, that, that we've been talking about um, for how to make atomic host development um, automatable, um, such as reverting changes that are broken, rolling back a package that later was found to have that should not have gone out, or um, describing the exact uh, NVRs and, and content that should go into a compose. And then there's a, there's a list of these types of things that if you don't use modules to solve that problem, you can invent something that looks a lot like modules <laughs> uh, to solve that problem. And uh, so modules, I think, uh, as a concept, they work really well. We need to, of course, work out the kinks, I think, and see when we splice that in to the, to the CI concepts for Atomic Host. But, uh, but it really does answer a lot of questions, and I think that's good. Um, let's see, where can you get more info? Um, the, the CI, uh, the objective that we have for CI CD enumerates these and refers to modularity. So there's bullet points down. If you, I think you scroll past the, the fold, you'll find that on the wiki page. And, and really, the, the only point I was trying to make there is that I, I wanted, uh, you know, I wanted modularity to allow for people to think about the problems they're looking at differently, right? It's not, you know, RPM is not the single answer, right? You know, or or our Koji or whatever, you know, like I'm not sure what the, quite the right word, but it's like the Fedora way is not the only way. We can have, we can think about things completely differently if we can kind of make our uh, pipeline more flexible. And that's really what the goal is. Who knows where it'll go? I mean, that's the point, right? Um, I mentioned that these are the new targets that were leaked to my mind. It's sort of the poster talk for, uh, for an objective that we need this, this transcript to, to give us access. So maybe that's something we can plan on. There's a specific problem of explaining it, and also it's a general problem, which we need to be well, better explaining things. <laughs> going into it, lots of, lots of people developing, or developing it and writing about it, it's useful to have something that, uh, that distills what it is about. So thank you. Next question. Uh, let's do the introduction. We'll yeah, we're going to, actually, usually we're going to pause for one moment. Uh, since we're on video and Steph showed up, uh, we're going to do a quick round of introductions. Uh, just so that we've got that captured for folks. Uh, not present is Josh Boyer, the FESCO representative. So if you're on video, know that he's not here. The person you don't see is. Yes, uh, I'm Robert Meyer, I'll, um, Robbie Duck. Uh, I'm the main lead of the websites team. Uh, FEMSCO member, council of, for the last three releases and uh, actually also FAMA. Um, my main goals are uh, representing the community, so the mm, non-Red Hat part of our community, and um, trying to get as much as possible outside to the, to the outreach teams uh, of what we decide uh, in, inside the council. Okay, so my name is uh, Jan Kuřík, uh, so the shortcut on IRC is Jay Kuřík. 
and uh, I'm program manager for Fedora. That means I'm taking, taking care of uh, scheduling, change wrangler, uh, election wrangler, and all this, not all, but some of this administrative stuff uh, around. I'm Brian Exelbeard. I'm Bexelby on IRC. I'm the Fedora Community Action and Impact Coordinator of the FCAKE. Um, I mostly have secret cabal meetings with Matthew Miller. Uh, and I work to try and empower the community to get to where it wants to go, whether that's serving as a liaison with our primary sponsor, Red Hat, whether that is, um, you know, working actually on hacking on things, doing things, showing up at conferences, whatever it is that I need to do to help the community be successful, that is what my job title is. I'm Matthew Miller, I'm the Fedora project leader. I've been doing this for longer than any other Fedora project leader, which probably makes me the craziest. I think that's uh, uh, Matt DM on all of the things. Uh, hi, my name is Justin Flory. Uh, my FAST is jflory7, IRC, JWF. Uh, I'm involved in a lot of different non-technical areas in the project, like community operations, ambassadors, marketing, the diversity team, uh, and a few other areas. Um, I was elected to the council this past election, so I'm be serving for the next two release cycles. Welcome, by the way. Thank you. I'm Steph, Steph W on IRC. Um, I've contributed to over a hundred different uh, open source projects, and that points to what I'm really interested about in Linux is integrating it, bringing it together, and making it work. So I've been involved in Cockpit doing that talking to all sorts of parts of the system and building a UI out of it. And now, uh, we, in that project, we, we used machines um, and, and bots and robots really effectively as contributors to the project and got really far down that road, down all the way to machine learning and um, training machines and so on. And I'd like to help Fedora be able to take advantage of that by doing CI, CD, and tests, which are really the foundation of those things. I'm uh, Langdon, and I'm Langdon most places, except on Twitter, where I am one, followed by Angdon. Uh, but uh, let's see, so uh, I think I am primarily thought of as the person who sets things on fire. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much me. I, I really, uh, I try to, think about how do we, you know, what what's coming? Like, how are we going to do the next thing? And how are we going to be capable of doing the next thing? And then how can we uh, take this kind of really amorphous future land problem and break it down into pieces that we can then turn into things like the Factory 2 project or turn into things like the base runtime and host and platform projects? Or how do we, um, you know, kind of specialize out into taking, you know, modules and bringing them back together again? So. Um, so my general goal, I think, is I want to see, you know, Fedora be the distribution as, uh, somebody quoted, I, um, I can't think of the article, but basically it's like, I want innovation around the OS, right? I don't want us just to be an upstream consumer that packages and distributes. I want the, oh, I want us driving change in how people consume, uh, software. And my end state goal is like completely nutter. So we can talk about that with beer or something. So. So I'll, I'll repeat the question briefly. Um, there was recently a lively discussion on Devel List where it was posited that perhaps there were ways to build parts of Fedora without RPM. And the question becomes, is that a core part of our identity? And basically, should we ride RPM into the sunset if it's a sunset, or into the future if it's the future? Or should we give serious consideration to possibly having parts of Fedora that are RPM-less? Is that 
Okay. I'm going to go first before Langdon talks. Uh, <laughs> now, um, so yeah, I think that uh, there are a lot of valuable things that RPM brings to the distro and the RPM management tools that are important to people. Um, I think doing those things in a good way that preserves the value that people get from them is core. Um, but I don't think that we should saddle ourselves to that horse as it rides out into the ocean. Um, or whatever, uh, yeah, not very far. <laughs> yeah. Uh. So, so I largely agree. I mean, I think RPM is a euphemism for a bunch of things that that technology happens to bring to the table for Fedora, right? Uh, reproducibility, traceability, um, metadata around what you know what the thing is, uh, dependency structure, um, you know. Licensing, uh, you know, lots and lots and lots of different stuff. You can look at all in one space to find all the nice software. Uh, one of the things that um, you know, kind of the, I would say most of the RPM distros value is that upgrades are unattended. Um, you know, things like that. It's not actually RPM, right? I mean, maybe it is for some people, but I know I certainly don't care about the particular piece of software that is providing that that set of features. Um, I think the set of features is incredibly important. Um, and right now, we have a thing that delivers that set of features, so why would we write a new one? Um, but that said, does it mean that perhaps we may want to, you know, expand upon it or write a new one or whatever? We might, but, you know, just like why would we sit down and rewrite Koji, you know, uh, for, uh, you know, there's potentially value there, sure, but it's a huge amount of work. And most importantly, it is a huge amount of testing. Right? We know Koji delivers what it delivers today. We know RPM delivers what it delivers today through many, many years of proving it. The second you try to greenfield that, you're in trouble. Right? That is a lot of work. And speaking as a software consultant who made a lot of money on doing those things, um, it is very, very dangerous. So, like I said, I don't, I'm certainly not married to RPM you know, or YUM or DNF or any of the kind of tool chain around it. But I am very married to the feature set it brings, and it's a really good tool at doing it. So why bother doing something different? Any other comments? Other questions, follow-ups? Yes? So uh, to paraphrase the, the question statement for discussion, uh, during the State of the Union, we saw a slide where Apple growth was shown to be um, both on a very strong upward trend and significantly larger than Fedora growth. And the question is, how do we convert Apple users into Fedora users and contributors? Or, I, I'm kind of paraphrasing here a bit, but also get them, frankly, to identify the source of the thing which they love. Um, is, is one of the takeaways. And the question was kind of a discussion point for the council of what do you think of these things? I'll take it and if somebody else wants to. Uh, well, why don't we start with someone from the audience. Mr. McGrath, please no Reddit references.
I'll paraphrase that briefly then. Uh, we think that there, there is some percentage of Apple growth that is driven by the use of Amazon Linux, which can also make use of a lot of Apple packages. And they present very different use cases and user base. And so that may potentially create a different answer for what we might want to do with this question to think about it outside of the bounds of the enterprise Linux family of distributions. He's I'm looking at the Amazon. Wait, I was going to say, we're going to let the Amazon guy speak. <laughs> So um, I want to be very careful when I paraphrase you here in case someone watches the video. So please correct me if I, if I misstate uh, or misspoke, misspeak. Yeah, all right, you can correct all of those things too. Um, but basically there is um, interest potentially in seeing Amazon become a greater contributing partner to Apple in both pushing tools and agents that are Amazon Linux specific, but also perhaps becoming members of the packaging and contributing community around heavily used Apple packages within the Amazon Linux space. Is that? Okay, thank you. That may not be held against anyone on this video. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll finally let Matthew talk. Seriously, <laughs> what was I even gonna say? Uh, no, I think um, Amazon people who are watching, I'd really like to encourage you to get involved directly in Fedora and working on Apple there, that would be awesome. Um, and if you um, would like to talk to me about that, off the record, on the record, whatever, I'm here for you. Um, in general, or, or on um, with, with CentOS in particular, I guess, um, you know, now that CentOS is kind of part of the Red Hat family, we've got CentOS people here at this conference. Um, I would really like to work more on building those bridges and making CentOS feel people feel like they're part of the Fedora community, and you know, uh, the other way around as much as much as we can as well. Um, I, th I, I have some hopes for modularity along these lines. I think I mentioned that in my keynote. If I didn't, I skipped something I think is important, uh, which is that you know, as we're building modules, um, those modules should run on you know, the enterprise Linux stuff as well. Uh, and I think that's an opportunity for bridging things there. I'd like to see you know, like CentOS SIGs, if we have modules that have like a three year lifespan, I'd love to see you know, that be a CentOS SIG working on that in Fedora to maintain that longer lifespan, uh, kind of fitting with the CentOS brand for a longer, longer maintenance window. Um, I don't know how we'll figure all that out, but I think we've got some opportunities for building that up. Uh, yeah, I think we've, um, I don't know, I'm kind of envious of our SUSE friends because they've got all of this stuff under one nice marketing name bubble of their leap and tumbleweed and all those things together. And we have some of the same kind of thing, but we've segmented it into separate communities and it would be nice to build those bridges up so uh, people who are CentOS users using Apple feel like I am a Fedora user. Um, and we don't feel like the people who are CentOS, they need that CentOS base OS. Like we don't feel like you can't be really part of our community unless you switch out your base OS for the one that changes every six months, uh, because that's not doing us any favors either. You kind of touched on some of what I would say. A, a very smart man said to me early into my role that Apple is in many ways the core of what Fedora is, because it is our core packaging. It is where a lot of, but certainly not all of our contribution has taken place historically. And an interesting objective idea that as a council member I would love to see fleshed out would be something around how do we grow participation in Apple as a way of talking about the Fedora project. Um, because that may, you know, we, we heard from our friend at Amazon, um, we, we have a lot of opportunity there to bring packages that might not ever land in Fedora proper without outside assistance of people who are not already in our community. So that could be a really cool third seat, which we did not represent with empty seats. But we have the opportunity to put more chairs up here for more than just the missing Josh Boyer. Clever. Thank you. I thought that was yeah. pretty good. And that's, that's an interesting point. So we've got, sure, we've got a, uh, sure, we've got a, a, a Festo, or a, a Twin Center, or an EFSCO rep mm -hmm. in the background right there. Yeah, uh, although technically the, the rep, FESCO rep is the engineering side rep, so yeah. Josh should, uh, uh, yeah, 
<laughs> I didn't want too many people at the table here. It gets unwieldy. <laughs> it's a balance. Other questions and comments? Yeah, I had a question that was posed to me earlier today that I think is a good question for the council. Um, so going, this kind of goes back to the um, uh, aligning everything with objectives question. And so the question that was posed to me was basically with somebody who's been an active ambassador for, uh, I don't know, ever, um, and that, you know, they recognize the kind of statement of that there's missing objectives and maybe we need to build uh, those up so that they're reflective of the things that the ambassadors do or need to do. Um, <clears throat> but the question was basically like that they felt like that their ambassador commitment was already the, the edge of the amount of effort that they could provide or, you know, contribution that they could provide and that actually being an objective lead you know, much less writing the objective, but maybe being the objective lead was too much uh, time from from them. Um, so, that's the question. I'll give it to Matt to start the response. Okay, do you form your question in the form of a question? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> no, what's the, so, no, like, so what's, what do you advise? Is the barrier to entry too high? Is there, uh, is it that this person just doesn't have the time and you're expecting somebody else to have the time? Are there ways, and I know we, one of the things that we had proposed mm. in there was ways that you could expand the effort so you could actually have uh, several people, right, that were gonna be leading an objective potentially. Um, so that, that's the question, is how does somebody go about this without it being too high a barrier to entry? Yeah, so um, it's definitely something that I expect would be a commitment, right? I mean, there's something, we don't want somebody to say, I'm gonna be the objective lead and then not show up again, that would not be good. Um, I think it doesn't necessarily need to be something that's a full-time job or a 10 hour a week job. Um, it would be nice if the person who's the objective lead can show up to most of the council meetings, and especially ones that are related to that objective. Um, but also, you know, maybe check in, you know, once a month or so with the report on how this is going, you know, go to the related meetings and things. So I think it's a, it is a commitment, but it's not, um, it's not necessarily an insurmountable thing. And it is also something that is, you know, time limited to this is an 18, you know, 12 to 18 months kind of thing. So you can say, I'm this is going to be my project for this year, uh, kind of thing and not like from the rest of my life, I am now the lead for this objective, um, unless you want to keep, unless you're Langdon who's <laughs> stuck with this, right? Um, does that, I was, I I was not very, yeah. Uh, objectives, you can kind of think about them like open source projects. You, you rarely will be as successful alone as you will be with a group. So you may have a great foundational idea for an objective and you can get it to the point that you bring in two or three people who are interested and one of them steps up to the plate to do the writing and one of them steps up to the plate to be the objective lead. Uh, I'll pick on Steph because the CI objective actually has a couple of people who were key in bringing it forward to the council. And when the council debated it and we finally decided to approve it, the big question we sent back to them was, you guys pick one person to show up because we're not appointing everybody to the council as the objective rep. And they had to go back to the table and I'm assuming it wasn't an arm wrestling contest because Dusty's bigger than you, but um, <laughs> you know, Steph, Steph won or lost depending on how you look at this. Um, but I, I think there's a lot of opportunity there for people to build a community around their objective to ensure its success and by virtue of that not have to overextend themselves. Yeah, absolutely. Like, like any open source project, if it is just your personal hobby thing, um, the success is going to be limited. If it's something where it is something there's a lot of people in the Fedora community who are interested in it, you should be able to build up a community around it, even if it's you know two or three core committed people and then some other people with smaller contributions around the edges. Um, I think things that are objectives should be things like that. And if you have a great idea, like I wanted somebody to show up and do a Fedora and OpenShift to look how great we work together objective, I put that idea out there and nobody showed up around to do it. So we don't have that as an objective because um, it takes it takes the you know people committed to do it to make it happen. I still hope we'll eventually get there because I think that's a good idea. But right now we didn't really have the people with the interest to do it, so it's not an objective. Can we have the follow up? Yeah. So I thought the answers were good, and you know, largely I think 
that was kind of how I answered as well. But uh, I wanted to kind of state it for the record, uh, and I think maybe a follow-up blog post might be a good idea. Um, but then in a related way, uh, you said one thing is like, how could you share this out? What's the what's the recommended channel that we should be sending out uh, calls for help for objectives? Would it be the community? Com blog? Okay, I, it, that's that's what I'm saying. It's like, so give us some answers. I, the answers for the answers for how to find help, I think, would be very similar actually to your question regarding finding people to assist with specific kinds of focused events in ambassadorhood. Look at the mailing lists within the project that are focused around that area. Look at the com blog, um, potentially even Fedora magazine, depending on the topic. Um, com blog has come a long way. That group has done a fantastic job of, I think, creating an opportunity for us to talk to people across the project who may not realize they're interested in a topic, so they never joined that mailing list. Um, so I'm going to push very heavily on com blog, mostly so Justin doesn't have to. <laughs> Um, I mean, I do really, I mean, that's something that from the very beginning of when the community blog was created, it was specifically with the motivation that there's these different silos across the project that normally wouldn't have a reason to communicate. So you'll have different parts of the community that are all working in different areas and there might be like that missing bridge between the two. And that's definitely from when we concept or when we concepted the com blog, that was part of the motivation. That's part of the, the driving one of the driving motivations for the community operations team as a whole. So if there was a group that I would say that would be willing to like have a conversation or help people with that, I, I would also probably point people to com ops, um, if not the council for specific questions to create an objective or to, to go that route. Um, but as far as communicating information across different parts of the project, that's definitely one of the uh, driving motivations for com ops. And the community blog is one of those uh, branches off of how we're trying to make it easier for people to keep up with things. So I definitely recommend, um, and I also would love feedback on this process too from people who have either written for the com blog or um, ways to make it easier for people. Um, because ideally we would like it very easy to make it, uh, to make it easy for people to keep up with the information that they want to. That's why you can go in the com blog, go to categories, council, there's objective leads, modularity, project atomic, and you can keep up with these very like very specific categories of Fedora, and it's the goal is to make it make that information accessible and visible. As it was once said, it's about bringing heat and light to these different different parts of the Fedora project and community, technical and non-technical. I have no other random questions for you. Yeah. Do we have any other questions that are actually from the audience? As opposed <laughs> to from Langdon? <laughs> it wasn't actually from me. <laughs> yes, sir. So, I have an earlier question about the Fedora Ambassador community objectives. You mentioned the, in the blog post, you, you mentioned the issue with running traditional Linux conferences, but something like 40% of events that ambassadors attend nowadays are 30-bit hackathons with uh, programming competitions for card games to have like, you know, two, two days, 48 hours worth of sleep to prepare a project. And I feel like you do get a lot of bang for a buck there because these, co these college kids are young and impressionable there's some law of Fedora that very likely applies. They don't have, have pre-existing opinions on it. But I'm worried that those college hackathons will not fit into the objectives unless it's really well, you know, the uh, Fedora for developers. So uh, the question was around the mention that perhaps traditional Linux events were not as valuable for impact purposes, uh, although they remain valuable for lots of potentially other reasons, in the blog post. And so the question is, how do hackathons work? And it, at least in North America, it sounds like about 40% of events that ambassadors are attending are college-level hackathons. And so how do you see that fitting in? You were the primary author. You get to go first. Um, I don't know, actually. Uh, so I have not, not been to a college hackathon in a very long time. So I don't, I, I'm not quite sure how uh, Fedora is working there. I guess I would like to see for those events, you know, specific goals, and then you know, are the, how do we measure them, and you know, are those goals achieved? Um, I think that there are things in these that probably can align with the objectives. I know that you know, student developer is one of the personas for Fedora Workstation, so uh, one easy answer is 
funnel all that through, look, we're promoting Fedora Workstation to student developers because that is something that is in, in the target audience there. And I think that probably can also fit for things like Atomic and the CI initiative. We can probably find hooks for those things there. Um, but I don't actually know the format of what these hackathons uh, is, so maybe I'll pass it to Justin, who does. Um, I think that there is kind of uh, two different ways of, of putting it. So uh, a lot of times that the students at these hackathons are very ready to try new technologies, and they go there with the mindset of intentionally trying to try new things that they wouldn't normally do. And I think there's actually a very strong case, especially for like containers, and that and looking at that kind of facet of it with containers and container orchestration. So I think that it's very possible to still have a presence at hackathons, like student hackathons, but the mindset for proposing how we're going to represent ourselves there is extremely important. Um, I think going in with a focus on knowing some of the technologies that we have available and being able to speak at least at an introductory level for them is really important to introduce some of those new things. Because I think if you, can make, if you can make a clear and convincing case like, hey, if you're developing, you're trying to do your app and you've done this just in like normal command line, like on your workstation, if you can introduce some of these really cool things, like you'd make it easier for our containers to, or to develop inside of the container and then try to orchestrate it with a, or host it like in a cloud platform for your own development and you can use some of these tools that are available in Fedora to do that. Knowing, being able to say that and know when it applies, I think is extremely vital. Because I think if you can just have the enough knowledge and understanding of some of these technologies and tools in Fedora to just kind of guide someone in that direction, I think that's a, a great way to actually have strong engagement with students, specifically at like collegiate hackathons, to engage with some of these technologies inside of Fedora, whether they're using Fedora explicitly or not, like on their on their laptop. I think if if, there, if, if I was looking at like an event proposal for a hackathon anywhere and there wasn't some kind of goal or some kind of plan to try to be like, I want, or we want to try to introduce these technologies, we want to try to introduce students to containers or, or Project Atomic as like a development platform, like these kind of things, I'd be a little more skeptical. Because you can send people to a collegiate hackathon, you can talk about Fedora, but I think the, the engagement and the, the interest you'll have from students is much higher too if you can talk about not just Fedora, Linux, Workstation, but if you can introduce them to these tools that they're already ready to try and they don't, might not even know exist for their projects they would use. I think it's just knowing ahead of time, kind of like talking points again, of the things you would want to kind of guide them towards. So like, I think it just it would require pre-planning before you go there to introduce some of these things. I'm going to play put Stefan Langdon on the spot. So for you, you've got these objectives, the atomic CI and modularity. If there were a, a hackathon and it's like, you're supposed to have something, uh, bring something with CI, at, you know, specifically atomic host CI to this hackathon, like what would you be able to bring and what would you get out of that? So I'm going to use an ex a real example, not of a hackathon, but something that had worked and it's pretty impressive. Uh, to me at least, what, what people come up with. The really cool thing when you go to these places is the new ideas that come out. Um, and so for CI, a lot of times we think of CI as the end all and be all. Really tests, and I'll talk about this more on Thursday at 5 p.m., so come. Um, <laughs> is tests are the, 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 the way to teach machines between good and evil, right and wrong. And so you, you build off this basic substrate and you start, start to get machines to do interesting things. And a lot of people at hackathons are interested in machine learning, machine training, and so on. So we, we took a bunch of data, half a million test results, with various fields associated with them, such as what was done afterwards and so on. And within a couple days of posting this, we get back and someone just hacked up a neural network um, predicting what, 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 kind of, uh, what kind of tests actually were real failures and what kind of tests were flakes. What, what a human would have done with these things, what they did in the past, predicting what they're gonna do in the future. So that's the kind of thing that, right off the top of my head, I would say, bring that to, to, to a college hackathon or to any kind of place like that. Bring data, bring these ideas and, and the framework necessary to enable um, teaching machines based on th this, this foundation. So I'm gonna cheat by first saying, um, uh, I think you have described a great objective of producing several playbooks for hackathons f to be used by uh, colleges to, you know, sell Fedora. Um, so that I, I I think that would be 
an objective in and of itself. It's like how do we how do we better approach hack days, you know? And I think that could be all on its own, um, and then incorporate things like the CI objective or whatever as some of the channels. Uh, as far as modularity is concerned, I think it, um, I think that one's weird. Uh, I think it's going to be hard because you've got to be really steeped in understanding what a distribution's about. Um, that said, I think as the tools get better, uh, there will be opportunity for people to um, kind of show new and different ways of kind of bringing things together to provide platforms or solutions. Um, but I don't think we're there yet. I think I think we've got another you know couple months um, before we we had something that we could give at a, like a college hackathon. Sure. But uh, so something that strikes me is that both of the these objectives um, are supposed to be enablers for then big steps in innovation, right? right? It's supposed to unlock what's then possible. So I, I don't know that we would expect a, such a hackathon to do the unlocking, right. but then to bring enough of it and to give clues and hints as to, okay, now help me the kind of, you know, s bring, bring some ideas that are based on top of this or like it germinate that and make that happen. So similar goes to modularity. It's supposed to be an enabler for then cool stuff to come out. That cool stuff is what we're after when we go an, into a hackathon, I would say. Yeah, I, would, I definitely would agree. I mean, I think the, the hackathons are way more interesting about um, like, you know, how fast, you know, can you put up a full development environment leveraging, you know, true CI, right? Um, you know, uh, well-known working components, which is the modularity part, um, and, uh, you know, and then, you know, shipping a machine learning engine. Um, you know, you can, we can show you how you can do that in, in like in a hackathon kind of setup way. And then the hackathon could be all about, um, you know, leveraging the countless, uh, you know, Matt's crazy statistics on Hotspot or on Apple downloads, and what what does that mean for the future of Fedora? I mean, you know, it's like they are enablers more than they are hackathons themselves. Great. I'll just add that I think it would be totally awesome if an ambassador went to a hackathon and came back with a laundry list of things that would make Fedora Workstation better for developers. And that's the kind of thing that we can also learn by going to hackathons and we get a secondary objective out of it. So I'll just toss that out there as a final keynote or a final point on that. Unless you all wish to be finally pointed. Thank you, Mike, for all of the questions. <laughs> um, you, you have 18 more minutes to generate yet another question, sir. Uh, we have 18 minutes, so yes. Orange. If you have, there, yeah, perfect. That's a great example. If you have, or if so, if each, of, if each of you had lots of time to work on it, what, what, ob or what objective would you, or would you pr or propose as the? It doesn't have to be an existing one. What, what, what would you, what would you like to do in Fedora if you were on a team? So the question is for each of the council members: If you had essentially unlimited time, um, what would you do as an objective lead in? Fedora, and I'm going to skip with no disrespect either of the two of you unless you want to come up with another one. Okay, so we'll start with uh, Robiduck. I'm not sure. We have a not sure. Well, what will be my objective? Uh, I would like to have some kind of uh, like automated tools for a lot of administrative tasks I, I'm dealing with. So having uh, these uh, automated uh, will be awesome, but at the moment there is uh, not enough capacity to, uh, to, to develop some tools for this uh, administrative task. So that's because I'm dealing with, uh, with this quite often. I'm spending a lot of time on, the, on this. Uh, that would be what I would like to like automate. So um, for me, some of you may have noticed we recently soft launched a brand new Fedora Docs site. Um, and I had a lot to do with uh, the work on that tooling. If I was to lead an objective right now, kind of dovetailing on that, I would love to see the Fedora project become an innovator in the space of documentation. Not because the world needs more innovators in that space, but because I think we have a general enough problem 
that the tooling that we come up with, the way that we could look at like what Robert and Annette are going to propose around user story based writing and stuff, we can actually demonstrate that for so many consumers that need this and we have the skills and capacity to actually bring it to fruition and show people how run this Ansible playbook and you have everything you need and here's the playbook for how you actually do the writing. So I think that's something where we could really be a leader. So I kind of like the open shift thing I mentioned earlier. I think um, you know, mini shift is cool, but if you want to go to a real deployment of OpenShift Origin, it is ridiculously hard. Um, I would love to see that become very easy with Fedora, um, but that's a lot of work. Um, so I also like your docs thing, um, and I also like that in particular, um, I'm a gigantic fanboy of Stack Exchange. I think they've got the Q&A thing down really well, um, and our Ask Fedora thing makes me sad every time I look at it because um, it's not the fault of the community, it's really the fault of the software, uh, because the software is, uh, it's, kinda, it's a one person project, that person has done a fine job, but it copies the surface of Stack Exchange and not the heart of it. Um, I would like to set up some, and Stack Exchange is great, but not necessarily perfect. Um, they tried to do a new docs site and it fell flat on its face, which is interesting. Um, I would like to see us set up something that combines the best of the Q&A thing with a real doc, short doc site because those things are really kind of intrinsically uh, connected because a lot of times like what people really want, I have a question, the answer should be here's the, the short documentation that tells you exactly how to do that thing. Um, so I, I would love to hack on that, but I, I'm not going to. I'm just going to look at it wistfully. So for me, it's not actually not a new objective, but more like a retired objective. There was formerly the University Involvement Initiative that kind of fell through for various reasons, but if, if I could take on a lead or I take on an objective with unlimited time, I would really like to see Fedora try to have a targeted strategy towards university and student participation, partially because I think there is a, a very large pool of people that we could attract both as not just users of new technologies, in the Fedora family, but also uh, potential contributors as well. And I think it requires a different, there, there's, I think there's two things you have to think about going into putting together a proposal for that because it's something that would involve people from, uh, ideally from all parts of the world. So you really would need to have representation from different areas and different parts of the world because there's not really anywhere that's quite like another place. Um, like as far as like different university structures and, and curriculum works and understanding how you can engage with those students. Um, but I, I do think that uh, there really is a large amount of interest in working with new technologies and you're able to introduce these things to students fairly easily as like I, like you said earlier it was actually or like Mike said earlier it was impressionable and ready to try new things um, but I, I just think it's it's it really does require you to think about how you're promoting technology in a new way because like when we go to a traditional conference or if we go somewhere like even like a specific, conference for like a topic, like let's say KubeCon or, or like a Docker conference or, or any kind of specific focused topic. People there know the technology, they know the software, they know the stack and you're just trying to show them why Fedora is a great platform or is a great way to accomplish their work with the tooling and, and what's available for them in, the, in Fedora. Um, with students, that knowledge isn't there. So you have to kind of do a little bit of extra legwork to introduce these things because sometimes they might just not know about why, like they don't have that background knowledge that someone at like a specific conference like KubeCon, everyone knows about Kubernetes, you're trying to tell people why Fedora is a great platform for OpenShift and Kubernetes. At like a student, or like at a student focused event, whether it's a hackathon or something, or some, some other kind of, of place, you, you, have a, you have to do that, some of that extra work yourself to try to make that picture about why these technologies are great and why it's, why it's helpful and efficient or effective to work on them. Um, so I guess why I just think it would take some participation to, to work on this initiative. It would take participation from people in, in different regions of the world and it would also require a little bit of extra legwork to think about how you're introducing these topics to people. Because I, I am really strongly believe that if you can get that presentation down, you could, uh, you would attract a a significant pool of not just users, but I think you would also invite people who want to actually have an impact to work on these technologies and to understand them better, and they would become contributors to different parts of the Fedora community. But. Yes, go, quick. 
So I have like three right now. Um, uh, two of them are hard technical, the other one is uh, softer, I think. But the first one is um, uh, significantly automate the RPM uh, spec file management and development. Uh, you know, so basically try to get it down to where, you know, it's no big deal for one person to be maintaining a thousand RPMs, right? Um, and you're not spot, right? Um, uh, that's one. The second one is automatic backporting of patches. Uh, so using static and analysis of code and fuzzy, uh, fuzzy search algorithms as well as generation of tests, um, can we actually say, okay, you know, we have this new patch for XYZ bug on the latest version of thing, you know, we can automatically backport it to the last 16 minor versions. So I think that'd be really interesting. I think we could actually do that a lot better than people think we do. Um, and then the last one, which is a lot softer, is uh, I would like a true end-to-end, -end, really heavily focused uh, development environment um, for uh, developers on Fedora. So in other words, like I want, I want all those guys who switch to Mac, I want them back, right? Um, you know, and uh, I want to have a true, truly awesome end-to-end -end developer experience where we add in all the knowledge we have as a distribution about what they want to work with and um, and use that as part of the information that we feed to the to the actual developers about what they're trying to accomplish and, and shortening the life cycle on development. So those are my, my three current crazy. I, for the purposes of the video especially, I, I think the breadth and depth of the different kinds of things that we answered shows just how many objectives we are missing. And that there's really a lot of opportunity to come to the council with an objective and not worry about us having a preset mindset about what an objective's supposed to look like. Because I think we would really kind of also like to be surprised by something completely out of left field. Or, or right field, I guess. But left field preferred. Anything that's some sort of sports metaphor is going to be surprising to us. <laughs> yes. Is there a final question or any f closing thoughts from members of the council? So, um, you're between me and a toilet. No, I'm just kidding. Go ahead. Yeah, well, you know, I pee. It happens. Yes, sir. What is your final question? Are the three editions that we produce and the spins, and I'm going to toss in labs, um, the right set of artifacts and outputs from the project? Uh, I think that with the switch from the generic cloud to atomic, I think that was a pretty good move, and I think we're pretty well set with things at this point. Um, I think we may need to make other corrections like that in the future sometime. That's the you know again staying at the innovative point on things. Um, I feel pretty good about our set of deliverables. I think maybe the one thing we're missing is the IoT offering of some sort. Um, Peter Robinson is not in this room, but he's got to talk about that somewhere else. Um, and I think, um, yeah, especially as we actually like get working on Raspberry Pi, and which is the most popular hobbyist thing out there, um, that will definitely help. Um, but yeah, I don't know. Um, as people come up, it, it, that's at, the same thing as with the objectives. Like. Um, those are things that should be coming to us as a community, like um, showing up. Um, if we can't think of it, um, it's, it should be coming from the community. Yes. What do you want to do? Of course, I have one. <laughs> oh boy, um, the only one. I, I think there's a gap uh, again around that kind of developer space. In that, like, I don't think we produce particularly good. I'm going to say vagrant VMs, but I don't mean necessarily vagrant VMs. I kind of mean like the things that you use as the VM to develop things on. So you might use a container for that, but you can't use that with mock, you know. So, you know, you might, so I think we have a little bit of a gap in there that cloud, the cloud edition was filling, uh, that I think Atomic will not. Um, and so I think we have, there is, there is something in there, but it might be fulfilled by a spin. It doesn't necessarily need to be an edition. So there's something, yeah. there's a gap there. Uh, Owen Taylor had a presentation at DevCon for this thing called Purple Egg, which is way up there in worst possible names, but basically a uh, 
Docker container based development environment, sort of like the developer assistant thing, but containerized with also a nice GNOME GUI around it, which I think uh, attacked that problem in a really interesting way. Um, he has no funding to develop that idea, but if it's interesting to anybody and they want something to hack on, I think that's really cool and I think that would, would help fill something that's missing in our developer story. Um, but it's not really an addition, it's just something, it's like a feature for Workstation I'd like to see. But, yeah. Um, I, I have to tell you up front, I am not actually a huge fan of the Spins Labs and Additions name set. I feel like it's very hard to explain to people who are not steeped in the project. But um, I would like to see us have more labs. I believe that we could easily answer more of our target audiences with some specialized builds, which I think better build systems will make easier and practical to do without me being attacked by release engineering. Um, but I feel like Part of modularity is this idea of giving the user what they want when they want it. I feel like labs are a great way for us to go, this is the fedora you want when you want it. Um, and it also, you know, you could argue some of these developer concepts are labs. Um, some of the target audiences that have been talked about are labs. Yeah, it'd be, it'd be great to have like a machine learning thing that's like the Python one that's focused on machine learning stuff, which I know that's a lot Python, but no. Uh, that is a lot Python already, but something specifically focused on this. We'll do it in Perl. Uh, there's five minutes left, so um, I'm gonna call it unless there are closing remarks from anybody. Um, I encourage you to go off and enjoy other sessions. There will also be sessions in this room if you wish to remain and enjoy. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>